So I'd like to start uh, with an acknowledgement of country. ABBA acknowledges the past, present and emerging elders from all the lands and waters from which the presenters and audience involved in this webinar come. And this includes at least the Ngarigo, Wanarua and Biribai countries. Um, could I ask participants to type into the chat box the country in which they sit today? That would be lovely, just in recognition of the fact that we're we're working together with traditional Aboriginal landholders to restore uh, this beautiful country. Now, uh, I also have apologies from Boyd Carney, who is who was going to be the fifth speaker, but has to pull out due to ill, Ill health today. He was going to talk about the um, Barrington Tops project, um, but we will uh, refer to that in uh, the discussion time. Now, we're also going to be running a poll to start with to get uh, an idea of uh, what sector you come from or, or what role you play in bush regeneration. So um, this poll should be appearing on your screen shortly. And there should be a, a tick box. So you just tick the one that best describes you. And that uh, will allow us to um, provide instant feedback about what our, what our audience is today at the webinar. So there we go, we've got some results. Uh, it's mainly paid bush regenerators by the looks of things at this stage, some students and some volunteers uh, with agency managers as well. So thanks for that, everyone. Now I'll introduce with saying that in the early months following the black summer uh, bushfires, ARBA uh, got to work. In March, 2020, uh, we decided to uh, pull out all stops to encourage agencies and private landholders to consider ways to assist native recovery, particularly through judicial weed removal in uh, ecosystems that were somewhat degraded already prior to the fire and were fire affected. So we, we worked to link volunteers with managers of high conservation sites. Uh, we had about 200 volunteers on our books at the time but uh, we were stymied by COVID. COVID put the kibosh on any activities at that stage. We were even working with Conservation Volunteers Australia who had 4,000 volunteers <clears throat> to see how we could collaborate to get some of their volunteers working with um, uh, skilled regenerators to do good work on high conservation sites. But nonetheless, ARBA persevered and we managed to um, continue work on at least five sites or six sites uh, using ARBA volunteers, many of them professionals or contractors. Uh, and uh, they were able to assist recovery at a number of sites over the past year. So this webinar tells the stories of work at uh, four of those sites. And we're going to start with Tom Clark, who's, who will be speaking about his work supporting the Mid-North Coast branch of NPA. So they're regenerating sites at Crowdy Bay National Park. We're not starting quite yet. Uh, we'll introduce Tom a little later because we're going to talk. Uh, we're also going, Tom will be followed by Deb Holloman. And um, Deb will be talking about her work helping uh, Wollongby and Upper Yengo Creek land care groups. And... Uh, uh, Deb will be followed by Jared Proust, who will fill us in on his important contract work delivered to National Parks and Wildlife Service for Yadda Yadda Nature Reserve on the South Coast. And, uh, and then I'll conclude uh, with a presentation on Arbor's work supporting Bush Heritage Australia at their Scottsdale Reserve property at Redbow, New South Wales. So I would like now to introduce uh, Tom Clark. Now, uh, Tom is a highly experienced bush regenerator and a birding enthusiast with over 20 years working in the private and not-for-profit sectors. And Tom will be discussing the process of prioritising actions post-fire. Thank you very much, Tom. Thanks, T.
Okay, everyone, uh, good afternoon. Um, this is um, a scene from the northern end of Kylie's Beach. Uh, and um, from this rock here through to Indian Head, is a, we have a literal rainforest. So um, uh, that's uh, a lot of uh, Crowley Bay National Park. This is where this is. Um, the uh, was burnt, probably pretty much all of it was burnt in the fires. Um, but uh, and the uh, the local National Parks Association people have had a, a fairly close uh, association with the park um, over many, many years, like 20 odd years. Uh, they know the place pretty well. Um, they have a lot of uh, different sites that they work. Um, but this is just one of them and it has been affected by the fire. So that's what we're gonna talk about here today. Um, Crowdy Bay National Park is on the coast and it's between uh, Port Macquarie and uh, who's the other big town? Tari, um, pretty much there. It's another lovely part of the coastline. There's many uh, parts of the coast that are represented in some beautiful places, but this is just one of them. Uh, what I'm showing you now is um, a part of a map of New South Wales that represents where all the fires were. Um, you can see there's some one, big fires there up in the mountains, like the, the higher country and the timbered country. But this is our park there, um, pretty much entirely burnt. Um, so it took us uh, quite a while after the fires um, to get access back into this place. Um, and um, I can't remember how, how many weeks it was. But it, um, it was good to meet up with Sue Baker. She's the leader of the National Parks Association uh, you know, Bush Regen Group. Uh, it was great to do a bit of a tour around and look at all the different sites and have a bit of a, a chat, a bit of a discussion, a bit of a think about what, how we might approach each one. Um, lots of different uh, sites that we looked at, but this one is, uh, that I'm going to talk about is the, the Little Rainforest. As you might be able to see, uh, the oops, I've gone too far. Um, in the back of the hill there, you can still see the, the uh, in this picture, the fire affected uh, vegetation um, and a, a much flatter ground in the back there. This creek is actually draining a, a very large, expansive uh, wet heath. Uh, but this little ridge that runs across to the headland uh, supports a, a little rainforest. The, um, a spot fire came over the top and burnt this section up here. So that's the section we've been looking at with regards to the post fire. So a view from within that burnt section, looking back over to the beach, uh, you can see some fire affected uh, banks and that's basically a margin um, at the at the uh, the seaside edge of the, the forest uh, before it drops through a, a like a, a swampy swale there. Um, you know the mandras and melanthra and uh, you know, some swamp lilies and things like that live in there before it hits the beach. Um, so there's, there's just this, uh, this, this margin of uh, banksias. Um, so uh, when we first walked in there, it wasn't this green, um, but the, uh, and there was actually some, uh, you know, some bare ground in here, um, but it was a little while because of COVID before we could get crews in here, like the, the volunteers actually start doing any work. This is a picture of our first day that we went in there and obviously some, some greenery had already started. Uh, but I'm showing you this picture uh, just to show you um, like the main uh, feature that's uh, guiding you know, how we're going to approach our work here. And that is this big hole in the roof. You can see there's no canopy. Um, so we, uh, we were happy then to um, just look around on the ground to see where the canopy was coming from. Um, and quite a bit of it, to start with at least, is going to be woody exotic plants. So 
except for in the, in the case where they're in direct competition with uh, natives, these exotic plants, uh, these woody weeds, were actually going to be our canopy for a little while. And at the time, I thought, well, that's probably going to be the case. We're going to watch these grow for at least a year or two. Um, that has actually changed. And I'll talk about that later. Um, so we're going to watch the canopy uh, rise up. Um, and as we feel fit, um, we're going to remove the exotic woody weeds um, just in selected uh, uh, removal. There was a fair bit of vineage coming in here, like Morning Glory and um, stuff like that. Uh, we determined that we would jump right on top of that to start with. So this is this is just uh, our work on the first day. We're chasing uh, a Morning Glory. And uh, what was the other thing we're chasing? Um, the, um, oh, the Cape Ivy. There's heaps of Cape Ivy in there. So, uh, but we've had, uh, we've been able to get in there uh, several times now um, and just take out some of those woody weeds as they've, as they've crept up. Um, of course, um, uh, during the, the rest of the year, it's been really humid up here. Um, it's been tropical, really. It's been warm and it's been plenty of rain. And certainly we've had too much rain just lately. Um, but um, everything is just growing like mad. Um, so here's, here's just a, a, a picture of, some, of the ground. Uh, I forget what weed I've removed here, but we're looking at the new canopy. And this is like little angle by the trammer here uh, poking up. There's already got some scrambling uh, lily running around the place. Um, so, very, very quickly, we knew uh, this place was very resilient. Um, it's uh, surrounded by goodness, like the, the bush around it is really good. Uh, it's not being impacted by terrible, you know, urban runoff or sort of, uh, you know, things like that that are going to ruin our, our show here. Um, and this is uh, what, we, what we're seeing here is the beach tamarind. And in the top right hand corner, left hand corner, sorry, is um, uh, some lily pilly. That's that's that lily pilly there is actually sprouting from burnt stump, and quite a quite a few of those uh, uh, trees were doing that, but others were going from seed. Um, just uh, as as the rain came and came, we got the the grasses jumped up like mad. Uh, a lot of blady grass, and in some places, uh, some soft bracken. Um, but other, other plants as well, other grasses. Uh, it's become, the grasses have become uh, just very thick, and you've got to bash your way through. So that's, that has helped um, with a, you know, uh, as a sort of a canopy over our bare ground. It's been fantastic. But it's not a monoculture. Uh, the grasses, the creeping through the grasses, there's lots of uh, lovely uh, viney things like these rubus uh, and glycines and things like that. Um, so the diversity of the flora has been quite tremendous. Uh, recently, um, I went down there and tried to document uh, what we had. Uh, and um, I was pretty happy with a list of plants I came up with. I'll just go through that shortly in a minute. This is this is um, a bit what after a couple of trips after, and you can see things are getting up. Uh, there's an omelanthus here on the right hand side. Uh, lots of tremor going mad. Um, a lot of the regen after six months is almost chest high. Um, it's just going mad. Um, so from now on, we can be less selective, I think, with our woody weeds. Um, the, the place is really booming. Um, so just looking at the plants that we've got, um, and these, these numbers are the, the number of species that we have in the various um, groupings that I placed them in. In brackets is the uh, exotic, the number of exotic plants. So there's grasses there 
out of the four grasses I've identified, there's one uh, exotic, that's the Ehata. Um, but for ground covers and vines, and the vines, look at that, 17, only three uh, exotics. Uh, I've mentioned two, what was the other one? I've got to find it again. Um, the other one was, oh, the pattern, there was what we found one passion fruit. So uh, that made up the third one. And um, with the trees and the shrubs, um, a great proportion of, a uh, wonderful proportion of native uh, species there. Um, just a few of the more usual uh, culprits like Bidu and Lantana and uh, things like that, the, uh, the, the nightshades. So all in all, the place is showing, the, showing itself to be very resilient and uh, diverse. So that's so far, 57 species. I know there's more than that there. Um, I know there's like at least a half a dozen other plants that I have, haven't been able to identify yet, but um, we're getting there. there. There will be more than that still, I'm sure, by the time I've finished. Um, so the, it's been well attended by um, the local uh, National Parks Association people, Sue, Sue Baker, um, uh, organizes people uh, very well, rounds people up. Um, the, uh, and like I say, we, we haven't just been working on this site, we've been working on other sites, but just for the case of this presentation. Um, we've, we've been uh, thwarted a little this year. We haven't been there very much at all. And we're all set to go a few weeks ago. And of course, uh, we were washed out. And we're more than that, we're flooded out. So we haven't been in there since the flood. Um, so we're hoping to get up there very soon. The, the areas are, are still closed at the national parks. So um, it'll be, be very interesting to see uh, what this little rainforest looks like now. Um, in May, uh, we will be having our, um, there's some more regen, look at that, the, um, it's just going mad. The, um, we'll be having our bush regen camp. Uh, these camps have been going for uh, a long time now. Uh, it didn't happen last year, but uh, it's been advertised in various places and that's just uh, a reminder that that will be happening uh, in May. So that's probably my talk. Um, and it's, um, if we don't, well, we'll have questions later, I reckon. Yes, that sounds fantastic. Thanks so much, Tom, for your presentation. Uh, we will, a couple of questions have come up during the talk and we'll move them to the discussion later. Okay, doke. Now I'd like to introduce Deb Holloman. Deb uh, had 20 years bush regeneration experience and is a retired bush regen coordinator for National Parks and Wildlife Service Central Coast region. Now, this experience and expertise came to the fore when Arva sprung into action to support landholders in the Upper Yengo Creek and Wollombi Valley uh, areas. And this was only weeks after the fires that uh, Deb was able to get in touch and help those landholders. So thanks very much, Deb. Okay. Just on the start of the slideshow. Is that coming up yet? All good. Just from, yeah, the from the beginning. From yeah, I've done that. From yep. yeah. There you go. There, there you go. Got it now. There we go. Um, afternoon all. Um, in March last year, 2020, um, there was a community meeting out at Laguna, which is out near Wollombi. It was about 100 um, attendees, and it was um, hosted by... Wollombi Landcare, um, Upper Hunter Landcare and the Australian Wildlife Conservancy. Um, Arba was asked to, um, to go out to provide advice for um, post-fire recovery works and on-ground on support. Um, there were three different landcare districts which were severely affected by fires um, in that district. So we met with a few of the um, conveners of the land care groups, and we organised to do an on-site workshop um, early in March, and then we all know what happened after that. So we couldn't do an on-site workshop. So what we had to change it to was um, two different Zoom meetings, which actually worked quite well. So 
we did one on the 29th of March uh, for the Upper Yango Creek um, land care group. And then on the 10th of um, May for the Wallen by one. We had a total of 32 people on, um, on Zoom. It was presented by um, and supported by Hunter Region Land Care and Arbor. Um, it's facilitated by myself, um, Paul Maligan from Gecko Environmental Management and Sue Pritchard from Arbor. So this is the um, map of the Upper Yengo Land Care Group. So that it, it goes right on to um, Yengo National Park. Yengo, you can see Finchley track there, if anyone knows Yango National Park. So this, these, these land holders back right onto the National Park and they got smashed pretty badly by the fires. The second one that we ran um, was for, for the Wallenby Land Care. Um, a bit more organised then and we got a, um, a flyer out. Again, we had about 20, 30 people out there at the Zoom meeting. Um, and that's the area that, that's sort of a bit, bit further west of um, the Upper Yango group. So that they're all the landholders there that were involved in that Zoom meeting. Now, the format of the, um, the Zoom workshops, we had to, you know, we sort of had to, had to make it up fairly quickly, but we, we got it done fairly well. We based a lot of it on a workshop that Teen had done. So basic bush regen principles we went through fire impacts on fauna, bush regen tools, they were very interested in what sort of tools they could use, and bush regen techniques. Um, I didn't have much expertise at all with, with, um, as far as bush regen. We had to, well, it's pretty hard to explain it over Zoom, but we managed to do it fairly well, we, we thought. Um, WHS, when it comes for, to um, doing bush regen, we had a whole list of different resources from books and websites and Facebook pages um, and different references. But the main thing that they were interested in, which was, which was good, we were fine to do it, was plant identification. And what we managed to get them to do, they sent photos in or actually even put photos up on the day. And we were able to identify a lot of the seedlings that were coming up. Um, and, and, and decide whether they were weeds or, or natives. So the most common questions, they were very, there was mixed camp on herbicide. Some didn't want to touch herbicide at all, others did. But we had to sort of give a bit of a talk on how herbicide can be effective if it's used correctly and what sort of herbicides to use and at what concentration, etc. The best place to identify, to um, purchase tools was another thing that they wanted to know. We gave them some local um, places where they could buy bush regen tools. And as I said, the most important thing that they needed to know was plant identification from photos. So the main plants that they put up, all those ones on the left-hand column, the natives, pretty much all of them, the, the people in the um, Zoom meetings thought they were weeds. So they were quite surprised to find out that they were actually natives. Um, Solanum, Sigisbecchia, uh, Philanthus, Michaelina, Cypress, et cetera. And then of course we had the usual suspects with the weeds, uh, farmer's friends, um, blackberry nightshade, wild tobacco, inkweed and, and um, honeysuckle. Um, here were some of the photos that they, they sent in, that, um, inkweed of course. Farmer's friends of course has gone crazy um, and they wanted advice on how to deal with that. And they were very pleased to find out that this was a, a native because it was coming up everywhere. They just assumed it was a weed because it looks like a weed, looks very prickly and unfriendly, but they were very pleased to find out that it was actually a native. And so what we had to do, we, we had to emphasize the importance of the bush regen principles. If in doubt, don't take it out. And the importance of vines, as um, Tom showed in that in his last presentation, vines come back vigorously and they're really, really good for the post-fire regeneration. A lot of people just think you know, that vines should be taken out, that they're all weeds and they kill the trees. But we finally got the message across that not all vines are bad and most vines are quite good. 
Um, so I think that's just about it. And sort of, and the outcomes and follow up. A WhatsApp group was established, and all these landholders are still in touch with each other. They're still asking me various questions and plant ID um, questions, which is good. The, the WhatsApp group's got a um, 36 participants in it. Another big thing that's happened that they were very, very keen to apply for some grants. They've applied for two very large grants in the Upper Yango, and they're supported by Arbor and Upper Hunter Land Care. What they want to do with these grants, they want to do vegetation surveys on what has actually come up um, and, and, how, and what sort of fauna is and flora, flora is surviving. Um, they want to, want to get on ground bush regeneration happening. And they're interested in um, traditional fire management. And that's a big part of their, because they're, they're all still very afraid that it might happen again. I think the fire really. It was the worst they've seen out there. And they're very keen to fireproof their properties. And if they can do it by using traditional ways of um, fire control, that's, that's the way they want to go. There's been fauna surveys have been conducted on, on just about all the properties now. Um, from um, Viana from the um, Australian Wildlife Conservancy. And they've found, well, hopefully we think they found koalas and foals She's actually giving a um, presentation next week on the whole list of all the, the fauna that they've found. So everyone was very pleased that there was actually quite a bit of fauna still left out there. Also, the Hunter Local Land Services and Soil Con, Con have been very, very um, prevalent in providing all these workshops on erosion control, bush regen techniques, um, planting, et cetera. So that's about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deb. Um, and it's a great thing to see in action the sorts of collaboration that we talk about being desirable between agencies and NGOs. And I think that case was a, a perfect example, um, as was Tom's. So now we go to the third speaker. I'd like to introduce Jared Proust. Now, uh, Proust Land Services uh, is, is his um, consultancy. And so he's been working as a contractor for National Parks uh, post fire. Now, um, Jared brings three decades of experience to the task and has been working in a measured frenetic manner since May 2020 to stem the loss of biodiversity from the overwhelming numbers and vigor of weeds occurring on these burnt sites. Now, Solanum uh, moritianum tobacco bush is, is one of the principal uh, problems uh, occurring in, in high densities. So there were greater than 7 million in the site that he was working on. So uh, these germ germinated after the fires. I'd like to hand over now to Jared. Thank you. Thank you, Tien. Thank you very much for that. Um, afternoon to all. Uh, I'll do a brief uh, talk on the amazing uh, Yatta Yatta Nature Reserve that is, uh, was a, when we first started work there 25 years ago, it was only 19 hectares. It um, is now a gigantic 36 hectares. Um, it's on fantastic volcanic monzonite, and it is a small remnant that is uh, just north of Milton on the south coast and about six kilometres from the sea. And it varies between 10 and 45 metres in altitude. And it's totally surrounded by farmland. And this surrounding by farmland didn't save it from those wildfires that, uh, as you can see from the slide, the smoke coming across and where it says Conjola Park Yatta Yatta Nature Reserve was just to the west of the highway to that and it bore the full brunt of those uh, fires on New Year's Eve 2019. So the, uh, there's three main north-south gullies in this um, reserve and they offered some form of protection from these fires. Uh, the Nature Reserve is the southern most limit of um, 
subtropical rainforest and dry rainforest, and we have red gum uh, forest plus a mixed gum and turpentine uh, forests that are poorly conserved in the area. Uh, we have 34 tree species that have been recorded in the subtropical rainforest elements here, and 19 species reached their southern uh, limit um, in this particular reserve. So what did we find? What did we do? Um, uh, from May last year to the present day, I came out of um, Yatta Yatta Nature Reserve this morning and I'm all a tingling from all of the dendrochnide, the giant stinging tree that has come up in gay abandon all through the reserve. So um, what we did find after we did the uh, April uh, rapid site assessments, uh, the fire had opened up large sections of the reserve that were previously impenetrable uh, due to the vine thickets. I uh, remember not being able to get through to many of the uh, sections of this reserve. And if you're looking at the aerial photograph that you can see at the moment, you can see the main uh, area of uh, subtropical rainforest running down from, through the, uh, the Karawa Creek and you have a Western gully uh, and a Eastern Northeast uh, gully as well. This is where the subtropical and the dry rainforest were protected. Um, this section that runs through the middle is thanks to the 1964 uh, electric electricity lines that they decided it was a good place to put it right through the center. And we lost about a dozen fantastic, huge old strangler figs. So what have um, we got left here now? Can I just We've, interrupt you, Jared, just briefly, because yeah. um, I noticed that your slides would look so much better if they were in full presentation mode. Okay. Would you be able to go to slideshow? Yeah, yeah, I can. Then uh, from this slide? How's that? Yes. Is that a good? Thank That's you. That's wonderful. That's okay. Sorry, I didn't have that before. So you can see that a lot better. You can actually see the areas that were burnt and the areas that are still green. And you can see some of the amazing strangler figs and churnwoods that are still standing out above all the rest. So we found that there was a roughly five hectares of subtropical rainforest. 14 hectares of dry rainforest and about 17 hectares of the red gum and mixed eucalypt forest. Of this, um, the reserve burnt about 75% um, and 20, so that's roughly about 27 hectares we had that was burnt. So half of all of the subtropical rainforest burnt, over 60% of the dry rainforest and virtually all of the eucalypt forests. The under unburnt areas were below the waterfall, uh, roughly about three hectares and along the riparian zone and in the uh, eastern gullies. Work commenced in uh, May 2020 after work, uh, after funds were uh, made available from national parks. So from the site assessment, I identified the unburnt core areas of the different uh, forest types. And we were allocated around about 50 person days to do some work to start off. So we prioritized the subtropical, then the dry rainforest. And if we had some time, we would look into the red gum forest. Uh, comprehensive weeding occurred. Uh, from the core areas and radiated upslopes and downstream. During this time, we found, um, we recorded uh, over 120 native plant species and about 20 exotic weed species. The main ones and the ones we prioritized were 
tobacco bush and Madeira vine. Um, and this has greatly expanded um, just in the last couple of months. So we've had to uh, do on the go um, uh, yeah, management of that particular weed. Uh, the other weeds that uh, we uh, were dealing with, uh, inkweed, two different species of senna, moth vine, two different species of uh, passion fruit. And we did have to deal with fleabane, even though it's an annual, and I might get a chance to talk about that uh, later on. We did put uh, one 20 by 20 meter plot in to try and monitor what was happening and what, um, what we were dealing with. Uh, the plot data I won't go into in full detail, but it is available if anyone does want the full data details of that particular plot. Um, the slide here, you can see there's about 10 people spread out across the slope and slowly moving up slope away from the immediate uh, core area and hand weeding at this stage. Uh, lots and lots of tobacco bush with the occasional other weed and lots of natives underneath all that. So in um, the May to July last year, we completed 43 days and we had uh, weeded nine hectares of the subtropical and dry rainforest. To give you an idea, we were dealing with a thousand tobacco bushes every 50 meters and that was taking us 15 minutes. So the nine hectares that we did, there was an easy 1.5 million uh, tobacco seedlings that were at this stage, as I said, manually removed. From October to um, last year to March this year, we continued as the tobacco bushes got larger and larger, less in number, but we had to move away from manual weeding into cut and paint. And so where the same 50 square meters we had originally, a thousand tobacco that had halved and where it was taking us 15 minutes to hand weed, uh, it now was taking us 60 minutes to cut and paint because by this stage, the uh, tobacco walk was up to two to three meters. You can see in this next shot, you're getting a lot of the tobacco has been removed and underneath you will see an amazing array of native seedlings. Uh, during, from May to September, we counted throughout the reserve, 50 native species that were germinating since the fires, 13 exotic, exotic species were still germinating. And of those, tobacco bush was 80% of the um, weed biomass. So we did find that the longer we left the primary weeding, the less species we were getting. So from the plot data, we were finding that we were getting originally underneath the tobacco after it was removed, we were getting 30 na native species, 650 native plants every 50 square meters. When we came to do the same plot six months later, it had dropped to less than 10 native species and only 50 native plants in that same 50 square meters. So we got half the tobacco uh, plants in that six months. It was taking us twice the long to deal with them and we were getting a third of the number of um, native um, species. 
So it was a amazing task that, um, as we all know, the bush regenerators up and down this coast and in and wherever else they are are amazing resilient creatures because not only were they dealing with the sheer weight of numbers of the tobacco, half the crew uh, had to start wearing masks because of the irritant hairs, which I can attest to, were causing breathing difficulties and also irritant to the eyes. And then to add to that as time went on, uh, the giant stinging tree uh, was doing its pioneer species thrust and we had to continue weeding, but in amongst thousands and thousands of giant stinging trees. Uh, the fauna is, uh, was amazing that when we started work there in May, we didn't hear one bird song when we did a brief bird count in January this year. We had 28 bird species, um, lyrebirds and catbirds and bowerbirds were all coming back. So it was quite amazing. And so the implications of this particular reserve for a fauna uh, hasn't even uh, had a look at and had a chance to do anything about at the moment. Uh, we only have just got the, a couple of hundred Flying headed uh, uh, flying foxes uh, have uh, returned just recently. So uh, we have high hopes that uh, things can continue in a positive light. The last slide I think I have for you is the plot, and it shows what the subplot that we were going to hand weed looks like in May, and you can see it was predominantly uh, tobacco with a variety of natives through it. When we went through and secondary weeded it in December, you can see that we have uh, removed all of the uh, second successional weeds and we have a myriad of native ground cover ferns, climbers, uh, and pioneer species. So uh, it is looking good for what we are doing at uh, Yatta Yatta, but we need a lot more resources to continue this valued work. Uh, and I think I'll leave it on that note. And over to you, team. Thank you very much. I just had a little trouble unmuting myself. Thanks so much, Jared. That was a very, very impressive. Uh, it just shows you how uh, wheat can actually replace natives. It's, it's often thought, oh, these will die back. But uh, tobacco bush at that density was clearly um, suppressing a very diverse native regeneration on that site. And it's fantastic to hear that the birds are also coming back and the fauna are side of this is terribly important as the other speakers have pointed out as well. Thank you. Uh, so it is my turn to uh, introduce uh, Tien, who should need no introduction, but I will <laughs> still do it anyway. Uh, so doc, Dr. Tien McDonald's understanding and interpretation of the restoration landscape puts her at the leading edge of bush regeneration practice. Her insights into the post-fire response are based both on theory and extensive practice. Over to you, Tim. Thank you very much, Jared. Um, yeah, look, I was I was really delighted to be able to participate in my Arbus project and um, and to participate in this particular project at Scottsdale Reserve, one of um, Bush Heritage Australia's most important um, reserves. It's actually one of the few that's. Uh, degraded. Most of them are, are intact ecosystems and this has been farmed uh, for many, many decades. 
So I, I work uh, also with Phil Palmer. Uh, now Phil is the manager at Scottsdale Reserve and he and his team are doing fantastic work. The whole reserve burnt in uh, February in 2020. Now Arbor's experience uh, of wildfire is uh, that it can offer a fantastic opportunities to support uh, the resolution of a whole lot of, um, let's say, legacy weed issues. So we had that experience at Lane Cove in 1994 when uh, a wildfire went through uh, Lane Cove National Park in, uh, in Sydney. And um, Arbor worked to assist uh, national parks, our friends of Lane Cove National Park specifically, uh, to set up at that stage, 18 or 19 uh, bush regen volunteer groups, post fire groups in the uh, residential areas surrounding uh, that national park. So there were groups scattered throughout that residential edge that worked on legacy weed issues um, below their properties and in the national parks. So we knew there had to be sites out there after these um, uh, black summer wildfires that we all experienced last year. So how it all started with Scottsdale was that we were looking for sites. We were spreading the word, Arbor was, um, that there may well be opportunities and are there sites uh, where high conservation value um, uh, reserves could be uh, could benefit from support from volunteers who've come to Arbor to offer their assistance. And we asked uh, Bush Heritage and they said, look, great, let's give it a go. Now, the site that they chose for us was Rutidosis Ridge, it's called, because it had um, button wrinkle wart on it. It was, uh, it, that is a threatened species, Rutidosis leptorhynchus. Now this site had been dominated by African lovegrass for quite a long time prior uh, to the purchase of, of the reserve or the property by Bush Heritage. And uh, some years after they purchased it, they uh, uh, trialled an innovative approach of aerially spraying with a, a very dilute dose of flupropanate herbicide. Now, this was carried out about three years prior to the fire. It's a grass selective herbicide and used it at a low rate like that, which was one hectare, one uh, litre per hectare. Um, it allowed even selectivity for the weed African lovegrass and serrated tussock leaving the native grasses intact. Now it wasn't clear whether there were native grasses on site but after the wildfire and after the African lovegrass thatch was burnt away, uh, yes weed was triggered to regenerate or, or, re or germinate but also uh, a lot of natives came up on site. So when we uh, had a look at the site in March 2020, we could see many, many native grasses uh, re-sprouting and in amongst all these stubs of African love grass and also germination of natives, including threatened species. Mostly forbs, but also native grasses and up to 30 weed species. So we thought, great. We were asked, could we spot spray the re-sprouting African love grass? Yes, we said, of course, but experience tells us we should treat all weed species in a situation like that. So off we went. Um, what we had to our advantage in the negotiation was that we were working voluntarily. So we weren't costing uh, Bush Heritage any, anything at this point and, and they were happy to take the risk. Uh, David Meggett was the coordinator of volunteers for ARBA and um, has done a fantastic job attracting volunteers to the site. And we've all had a lot of fun. Now the fire did exactly what was needed ecologically at this site. It, it removed the African love grass thatch. It cued germination of natives such that we're in the soil seed bank and it flushed out weed to allow us to treat that weed. So it would not uh, lay down an, another weed seed bank. So we saw the fire as an opportunity to reset the ecosystem along a trajectory of recovery and health. So that was great, Bush Heritage agreed. And uh, we've had three residential camps uh, during the last year, and we've got another one coming up in uh, later in April. 
Uh, we had local volunteers coming multiple times a month as well. In winter, we had uh, a rest. There was nothing happening in winter, but um, we had good rainfall in autumn and spring and also in summer and had uh, a much greater growth than was anticipated, considering particularly we'd had three years of drought. Now, Bush Heritage has also now supported the project with some paid contract money. Uh, that was because there was so much uh, rainfall and so much response from the ecosystem. But uh, what we've managed to do is um, definitely the volunteers have saved a hell of a lot of money for the for the quality of their work achieved. So it's costing about four thousand a year at the moment instead of fifteen thousand. Uh, but it's uh, ten hectares we're talking about and high quality <coughs> vegetation. So here we go, one of the camps, this was held in November last year. Uh, there were 15 volunteers came along that, that on that session and most of them uh, were very happy to work uh, using knapsack sprayers because it was really an essential, uh, handwork was possible in some areas where there were perhaps threatened species, but the size of the site and um, the opportunity uh, to um, avoid off-target damage because of the um, degree of open space allowed us to use um, knapsack sprays. And this, uh, the density became of natives became uh, higher over time, um, but there was two essential skills we needed in this uh, project. One of them, of course, is a a high level ability to recognize natives and weeds. <laughs> so all our volunteers, if they, if they uh, hadn't strong skills, they had to work slowly with us, uh, supervised uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis from the start. They had to have an ability to avoid off-target damage. And uh, it was fortunate that we have had people who were experienced in bush regen at other sites. They might not have known all the grassland species, but they learned very quickly. Also, uh, the organisation has to have a commitment to rigorous follow-up, and that means the volunteers need to be prepared to commit themselves to rigorous follow-up. So we had, um, as I mentioned, at least 30 weed species across the site, but 60 or so natives, uh, including a dozen or so native grasses. So most of those 60 natives were forbs. So they were what people often call herbs. Um, now they include threatened and, and uh, not well represented species. And we've had a fantastic time getting to know them over the year. These ecosystems are, are really full of wildflowers basically. And uh, the diversity is, is a joy to behold. Um, now, Rugodosis is, is here in the uh, top left. That's it germinating. It also has re-sprouted. And on the bottom of the photo is um, Swainsona sericea, silky Swainsona, which is a, a threatened species. Um, and it germinated and re-sprouted in places too. Now, up on the top right, this is just to illustrate how if we, if we didn't know all the species and we couldn't necessarily find them out. And if we're in doubt, we left them. And so you can see I've carefully sprayed that Vipers boo gloss at the top there, avoiding what turned out to be a weed, proliferous pink. <laughs> uh, but you don't know. So you have to take your chances. And we've been catching up with proliferous pink this season. We did, as I mentioned, uh, we've been working on approximately 10 hectares, maybe a little bit more. So we've been sweeping um, systematically uh, through zone A, B, C and D. Uh, there is a, um, a mosaic of condition across the site and it reflects uh, where impacts of grazing have been higher. So that mosaic um, if you colour it or map it according to the National Trust's uh, red, orange, or green, blue, orange and red um, system, uh, it ends up looking something like this. So that sort of um, olive green in the top right hand of the picture is a class zero site where it had no resilience and that's going to be earmarked for reconstruction. But all the rest of the site uh, is perfectly well suited to assisted regeneration. There may be 
uh, an opportunity for some combined reintroduction assisted regen on some of those red sites. But if they're small and within uh, other sites, they've got a real capacity for colonisation to take place. So um, the spe spectrum of condition will improve over time. We, this is the most recent uh, photo showing that African lovegrass is unfortunately coming back into the system. Flupropanate uh, does um, act upon germinating seed of African lovegrass over a period of years, but the fire must have denatured that or it was time for another treatment anyway. So we're getting a lot of African lovegrass coming back on the site. Uh, the managers are, have committed to re-spraying, aerially spraying again, this winter so we hope that uh, that will secure the site and that the uh, condition of the site will actually shift up one class so all those colors will, all those that mosaic of different uh, condition classes will shift up one condition uh, uh, assuming that we have a uh, a very successful flupropanate aerial spray this winter and presuming that we can continue to uh, mop up any remaining weed over the next couple of years or so. So we are optimistic that this will work and we are hoping that we'll continue to get support from Arbor volunteers. So thank you very much. That's my talk. So that actually concludes our, our speakers for today. And um, we're now moving to the um, question and answer session. So um, we have a number of questions already and we might um, start with uh, questions that were, oh no, we're gonna have a little stretch. So how about we all have a little stretch before questions? I'm going to. I've already managed it. <laughs> Now you don't have to do all the stretches that are on that slide there. Um, Not all of them. <laughs> and there are no prizes. So don't forget to type your questions into the chat and we'll keep the chat open to have a look at it. Um, now, one of the earliest questions was for Tom Clark mm -hmm. and it was Tom, um, one of the... Uh, one of the uh, viewers has noticed that navy, native guava was pictured in one of your sites and he thought that he saw symptoms of myrtle rust on that, um, on that uh, specimen. Do you have a comment to make about that? Uh, okay, that's, that's interesting. Uh, we haven't noticed myrtle rust um, in that site at all. Um, so, no, I... I don't know about that. Okay, well, could JB just perhaps um, email Arba with your contact details? Perhaps we can um, yeah. put Tom in touch with you and we can have a chat about that. But if there's myrtle rust on site, that could be problematic and, and uh, raise um, the need for further protocols to be put in place for sure. that, that site. Um, also, somebody asked Tom over what time scale do you think this project will take? Yeah, um, well, to be honest, when I when I first um, we first walked in there before we started doing any work and we were, we were sort of looking at uh, what we might do uh, with each of the sites, um, specifically in this uh, littoral rainforest, um, I was I was saying to, to Sue, look, this is this is going to take us. Uh, this is a long term uh, thing. Watching this uh, canopy rise. Um, it's going to it's going to be like eight years before we're walking underneath the canopy. Um, so we've just settled ourselves down to going slowly in there. Um, but uh, honestly, the the rate of growth of everything up here around the the Camden Haven has just been unbelievable. Um, and you know our our uh, pioneer, uh, our pioneer plants are just like two months ago were chest high. They were racing up. It's it quite interesting. So 
you know, it's, it's certainly going to be, it's going to be like a five year thing before we, you know, we've got some structure there and, and it's sort of working like a, a literal rainforest, I guess. But um, we'll, we'll, we'll be uh, still working on the thing, you know, in um, you know, another eight or nine years as well. Uh, there's some elements of the, the work that we're going to do there had, had nothing to do with the fire, um, but there's a, a, a soak that comes out of the side of the hill and it's, um, it's covered in uh, crofton weed. So that is going to be something that we'll, we'll uh, deal with over time. Um, but as far as the fire thing is concerned, it's, it's certainly a, you know, a five plus year uh, proposition. Thank you, Tom. That's that's a good answer. Um, and uh, the other question for you, just quickly, is is would the regeneration have occurred anyway without the group's help? Uh, look, <coughs> the the resilience of the place. Um, I'm quite certain if we had never gone there and had not even looked at it, it would have. Um, uh, you know, we would have been all these things would have been growing like mad. Uh, we would have ended up with something that resembled a, a, a little rainforest because that's what it wants to be. Um, but it would be compromised by um, by that time by uh, a, a shrub layer of um, uh, you know bitter and lantana and stuff like that. Um, the assistance that we're giving it. Um, Will um, mean that it'll be it'll look more like its neighbours, its neighbouring uh, little rainforests, than um, than if we had you know we just leave it alone. Thank you so much. That's good. Uh, we've got a few questions for Deb. Um, Deb was was planting versus regen. You know, a hard uh, message to get across. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's very difficult to explain bush regen via Zoom. Um, and yeah, we we had to we had a hard time explaining bush regen techniques, but that, that since the, the Zoom talks, they have actually got on board and are and are quite prepared to use bush regen techniques that we, we, we recommend. So I think it'll be fine. Uh, and and that, and as, as we explained, it's no good planting because it's it's nothing no no seeds to collect to get plants going. We have to explain provenance and all those sorts of things, but. They, they got it all. We got it across, I think. Okay, that sounds good. Um, and um, how, how good was the bush regen knowledge of the group? I think you answered this pretty well yeah. in, in your talk. Yeah, well, it was fa fairly fairly poor, but, they, um, but they, they're all on board and they're sort of, they, they've been talking a lot to with um, Paul Melligan with Gecko Environmental Management, and he's done a lot of um, explaining of bush regen and demonstration actually on site since then. So, so they're, they're on board, which is good. Okay, that's terrific. Um, and there are a couple of questions uh, for Jared. Um, what was the actual technique uh, for your weed treatment? You, you explained in the talk, didn't you, that there was cutting, uh, cutting and painting after, uh, you were initially pulling out weed, hand yeah, removal, and then was, later um, when, yep. It, 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 like all sites, it depended on the type of weed, the uh, proximity to uh, natives, the age of the weed. So when we first started off, uh, we were just uh, working our way across the slope, uh, slope uh, just doing hand weeding. And it was only with time that we were getting so many natives and the tobacco and inkweed and other weeds were getting to a certain height that we no longer could uh, justifiably do hand removal and we had to uh, do cut and paint. We didn't have to worry about the disposal of the material, even though there was just so much material. Uh, it wasn't going to reshoot the ones we were dealing with there, like uh, not like say lantanas or uh, privet, but we had to find viable areas to place. You can imagine what two million uh, tobacco seedlings area that that would take out. So we the uh, weeding techniques were uh, linked to the age of the um, weeds, but also how we 
disposed of the material, we really had to be careful because there was no point of just throwing it anywhere We because we would have um, destroyed so many of the natives that were coming up. We did do some trials of spraying, but um, it was uh, not thought to be warranted for the areas that we were doing. Um, we will be spraying uh, Madeira vine when we go back in soon. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for that. Um, another question uh, directed to me was whether Arbor and Bush Heritage Australia were advocating for more small scale burns led by First Nations people working uh, with fire, so with, working with the fireys, you know, the RFS. And um, look, that's being discussed at the moment. Bush Heritage has a great relationship with uh, a local uh, group who has done um, a survey of archaeological value of that very site we worked on. And ecologically speaking, I would um, suggest that burning is included in the future. Um, and, and it's a no-brainer to think that it should be mosaic burning. Um, at sort of fairly high frequency compared to what it might be in other ecosystems. So, you know, maybe less than five years. But why I think that it could be very useful is because um, some of the areas didn't burn and may still have African lovegrass seed in the soil seed bank. And it would be very nice to flush that out. Although my understanding is that uh, it's persistent only for maybe 10 15 years and so it's possible that they may decline over time without fire but what happens uh, with grassland is if particularly you've got a, a um, kangaroo grass um, ecosystem with kangaroo grass dominance you can lose your intertussic spaces and um, you can reduce biodiversity over time so you can lose lots of those forbs um, so as, as we, you noted, there were over, over 40, uh, 45 forbs there on site. Um, so burning would be, uh, would have a, definitely have a role and, um, and uh, yeah, it could be fantastic to do it in collaboration with First Nations peoples. Um, there was another uh, question um, for Gerard, uh, because, uh, 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 when you did that spray treatment, um, was that on the idea that it was an overspray protecting the natives underneath it or was that not possible? Uh, the spray was carried out in um, an area adjacent to where in the 20 by 20 metre plot we did one section was cut and paint, one was uh, hand removed and then we did a spray. And that was carefully sprayed uh, the uh, dense tobacco uh, cover. And even with the most uh, sensitive uh, spraying that we could do, um, most of the uh, uh, natives underneath didn't survive the spray. And we found a different... Uh, suite of weeds um, were successional on the sprayed area compared to the uh, cut and paint and again compared to the hand removal so we didn't find it was justified um, we'll see I have to go back in there it's nearly a year since uh, we started work so I'm not too sure over this one year, two year, five year, whether if we're talking about mosaic fire, whether we've got such a huge number of weeds where we do a mosaic spray and realize that we are going to lose a certain percentage of the diversity that's underneath what we spray and whether we are uh, yeah, relaxed about that occurring. So we it it can be considered, but we really need to look at the 
short term and long uh, and long term uh, consequences of that. Thank you. Now, Gabriella asks um, whether any of the projects uh, have used um, artificial shelters or perches, or I presume this could also include um, uh, debris piles or uh, whether in fact there was any transposition of soil seed bank undertaken. Uh, Tom, would you like to comment on that first? Okay. Um, no, there hasn't been anything like that uh, in any of the sites we've been looking at at Creative Bay National Park. Um, <clears throat> mostly the, um, the fire has opened up a lot of, lot of places and it's given us an, an opportunity to, to actually find some, some uh, plants that we didn't like or we don't like being there. Um, so, but, but being in uh, soil with uh, seed bank, uh, there was, there was um, one, um, one attempt to throw, to, to hand broadcast some seed over some bare soil. Um, Look, the, and the, uh, the regeneration that everything has uh, jumped up out of the ground so fast, it's really impossible to tell whether, that, whether we're looking at that seed or the, the, the stuff that was there originally too. Um, but um, the, the rate of uh, regen right across the park has just been phenomenal. Um, there's, there's still some bare patches um, with, I mean, the, the fire burnt very hot in some, in places, um, but uh, oh god, it, it, there was no need. There was absolutely no need to uh, to do anything like that. What about um, uh, shelters for fauna? Was there any need to support fauna? Right. So um, from what we could gather, when we were finally allowed into the place. Um, the, there was a, a paucity of, of fauna, um, the, uh, but the, within 12 months, I mean, we had wallabies in there in 12 months. Um, the, uh, has, there hasn't been any, to my knowledge, um, and certainly our group, we haven't done any formal uh, surveys regarding that. Um, but the, um, there's... You know, 12 months after the fire, there's plenty of habitat. And, uh, you know, the place is being um, populated by all sorts of, uh, you know, birds and insects and, and stuff. Uh, there, there was no, there was no um, uh, you know, conscious effort to go and put, I don't know, nest boxes, shelters, anything like that. Okay, thanks. Uh, do any of the other speakers wish to address that question? Um, there was yep. not much out out along by ways as far as that concerned. They were more concerned with soil erosion than um and than, than, than transporting new soil in. But I know they have been using nest boxes uh, to encourage more fauna back that way. So, Thank yeah. you very much, Deb. What uh, about we, we have taken um, some soil samples out of some of the different uh, the different forest types uh, just in sea trays and put them under optimum conditions just to get some data on what's actually in the soil even though we're seeing uh, a huge variety come out uh, we just want to see what's in there now and to be able to uh, see if there's anything different happens and also as fauna starts to come back in uh, we're looking at, as we've done in other sites, of putting seed trays in under, say, eucalypts, because uh, some eucalypt forests have been fantastic in eucalypt recruitment, but in Yatta and in some other other euc forests that we're dealing with, eucalypt recruitment hasn't been has been uh, yeah varied to say the least. So we're looking at putting some seed trays down with some cages over them uh, to see if we'll get uh, some eucalypt recruitment from the seed fall. Uh, that's something else we're looking at, but how much we, uh, we time we get to do that is again 
up to the lap of the gods. Thanks, Jared. Yep, I, I know that there are some uh, eucalypt species in some of these wet sclerophyll forests that uh, aren't quite as well adapted to uh, high intensity fire and uh, some of them uh, are looking like uh, they may be um, not responding as well as other species. Um, so there's definitely concern about um, increasing drought and um, climate drying globally. Now, um, I think this um, comes, brings us to the end of our time. So what we're going to do now is um, cap off with some future directions of ARBA's program. So um, we want to draw your attention to the fact that there are more post-fire resources on ARBA's website, and we're adding to these from time to time. So if you can check those out, uh, the recordings of this webinar will be available for download on the website and it will be through a YouTube channel. So ARBA has a, um, uh, a Regen TV YouTube channel. Um, also, I'd like to encourage everyone to keep an eye out for updates on activities with respect to opportunities for volunteering uh, with ARBA's post-fire uh, program because it's a fantastic support for uh, the managers of high conservation areas who haven't, haven't sufficient funds uh, to employ contractors. Um, now we uh, make that information known on our Facebook group, Post Fire Bush Regeneration, so that if you could just join that group, you'll be able to catch up with any of the new announcements. Also um, subscribe to YouTube, our YouTube channel. Uh, whose address is there on the screen, Regen TV, YouTube. So just search for it and subscribe because you will then receive alerts on the latest information that's um, uploaded there. Uh, and um, I have an important announcement about that just shortly. But before I make that announcement, I'd like to say that um, this webinar was solely about the New South Wales projects. Uh, Arbor has also attempted to reach out to support um, land managers in Victoria. And we had a very good response for, from Arbor members from Arbor, Vic, Arbor Victoria, which is a branch of Arbor. Now we were not able to link those volunteers with sites in Victoria because of COVID and they had so many lockdowns. Our partner uh, NGO in Victoria is Trust for Nature. And we're actually collaborating with them on a webinar to be held in late May. So keep your eye out for that. It'll be announced on ARPA's Facebook group. Um, so that'll be of great interest to all, I believe. Now, um, about that special announcement, we've got a little bit of time left and we'd like to launch the... Oh, yes, before I do, here are some sites here on the screen about post-fire volunteering. So we've got those dates of Scottsdale in April 27th to the 29th of April, Crowdy Bay, May 17 to 23, and Barrington Tops has two activities.